Now, I've covered a few general elections in my time. And this week, as Rishi Sunak stood in front of the podium to delay a raft of green policies, well, I hate to say it, but it felt to me like a stump speech. Now, don't worry, I'm not predicting an election, at least not right now. But this week felt like the start of the long campaign. And you can now see very clearly the ground on which Rishi Sunak wants to fight. The other big story was the allegations of rape against Russell Brand. He denies all wrongdoing, but it's raised important issues about our media culture and about whether lessons were learned from Brand's past behaviour. I've spoken to the woman who was at the centre of a previous scandal which led to him being sacked by the BBC. But first, here's my conversation with the Justice Secretary, Alex Chalk, about the Prime Minister's climate climb down. So what did you make of the Prime Minister's speech? Are you relaxed about this idea that he's delaying some of these targets? Well, I mean, the first and most important thing, I'm, sorry, I'm passionate about addressing uh, climate change. It's mission critical that we do it. But what the Prime Minister said front and centre is we have a legal commitment to net zero by 2050 and we will meet it. But also, where we will get to by 2030 is we will reduce our emissions by 68% compared to 1990 levels, which is far more ambitious than the EU, which is around about 55%. We have already decarbonised compared to 1990 levels by around 50%. So we have the strongest record in the G7. So what's important for me is, are we still committed? Yes. Do we have a plan to get there? Yes. But I also accept that if we're going to get there, we've got to take people with us. And if we don't, we risk discre di di uh, you know, effectively discrediting something which is critical to the future of humanity. You know, what, what, what I don't get, right, is a Prime Minister says that he's still committed to yeah. this 2050 net zero target. Yeah. If you, you know this, if you're going to get there, mm. you have to take some difficult decisions. Some people right. are going to have to do uncomfortable things, difficult things to do them. Yeah. And so it's completely disingenuous, it feels, to have a speech when you say, look, don't worry, you're not going to have to do any of that difficult stuff, but we're still going to make well, the target. Look, and the first thing to say is we have done some difficult stuff and it's delivered results. So we're responsible as a country for around about 1% of global emissions, probably a bit less. As I say, we've reduced ours compared to 1990 levels by 50%. Uh, so we're going to take. But if I just say, if you look at China, that's like 27, 28, 29 you, you, percent, and that's treble. You've made, and that's treble. You've made the so, point yeah. about how our record on this. So no, no, let's come, let's come so to the specific. The, what are the difficult sure. decisions? So what the prime minister said very clearly is that if, for example, people wanted to get a, an air source heat pump or, or ground source heat pump, but particularly air source, that he would be increasing the subsidy by 50 percent. So what that's doing is moving away, as it were, from stick more to carrot. Because in my constituency, three of the wards that I represent are in the bottom decile of income per capita, not just anywhere in Gloucestershire, but anywhere in the United Kingdom. And if we are to say to them, come what may, you will have to pay five, 10 or 15,000, there is a risk that you bring this whole thing into disrepute. And that in turn, and this is the critical point, imperils our ability to get to net zero. So, so long as we're gonna get there, if the path has got really, to be credible. Do you really, really believe? Do you know do why you I do? Do you really believe shall I gonna Yes, get shall I tell yeah? you why I do? No, shall I tell you why I do? Okay. This is the country, not like, like, unlike any other G7 country that has put it into law, point one. Point two, we have the Climate Change Committee that holds the government to account. And yes, says stuff like, you know, you need to improve this or you need to change that. But we are, are a country that says, if we make that commitment, we will set up the arrangements to hold the government to account. So yes, I do, and I have confidence in this Prime Minister to deliver I, it. I just want to play a, a clip of you. Uh, this is a speech you made in 2019 when you were trying to enshrine in law the net zero target. Yes. Let's have a, let's have yeah. a little watch of this. But although this bill was conceived before the Extinction Rebellion protests, those demonstrations were a timely reminder of the growing democratic drumbeat across the generations for the new radicalism that I've spoken about. And this shows the real power of net zero, not just a project of moral necessity, but one of economic renewal too. I get why you, after having made that speech and having the sort of environmental mm. beliefs that you mm. do, why you have to try and convince yourself that you're going to get to 2050. No, uh, shall, I, shall I tell you why I'm, I'm positive? Right? If, if I was sitting here and said, you know what, we're going to get there by 2050, uh, our record hasn't been great, then you would have a point. But actually, but our record about, is I'm, amazing but I'm talking compared about to other countries. The, I'm, I'm talking about what happens next. I agree. The, the, the Prime Minister has said that he's going to delay yeah. the ban on petrol cars. Right. That is a huge policy. Do you back that? So, do, you belay, do you back that specifically? But, but this, I, back, I, back the, I back the Prime Minister's route. But here's, here's an important thing. Do you back delaying delay the ban on petrol cars? There's petrol cars, yes, and also the business about air source heat pumps. So uh, air source heat pumps, as you may know, work for some properties. They don't work for other properties. Now, what the Prime Minister is doing is saying that he will increase the 
the subsidy up to £7,500, which is a tough decision because money, there isn't a load of flush money to do it. So that means that people can, in appropriate circumstances, do it. But I know that there are some of my constituents who it will never be possible to put an airsoft heat pump in there because it simply won't work. In those circumstances, are we to say to them, well, you're going to have to do it come what may. You're going to have to spend the five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds, and they may not have that money. And the thing that worries me is, if you look at like whether it's just stop oil or others, fine. I understand the principle, but if you toxify it, if you discredit this critical campaign, you won't take the British people with us. And if you don't take the people with us, we won't deliver on our targets. The car industry is pretty unhappy with all this chopping and changing. You know, they were gearing up for a 2030 ban on petrol and diesel vehicles. That's been kicked down the road. I just want to read you what Ford have said today. Our business needs three things from the UK government. Ambition, commitment and consistency. A relaxation of 2030 would undermine all three. I mean, they've invested 430 million in this. You can see why they're upset. Look, look, they have. The thing to bear in mind, of course, is what... So 2035, that doesn't just put us as a, as a laggard, as it were. That's the same as France. Germany, look, Italy, you're making Canada. all these. Look, you're no, making but, all these but there's international a, there's a, there's comparisons. A, but there's I'm a reason, you, but there's like, a reasonable the, points the, to the, make. These, these businesses mm. have committed hundreds of millions of pounds yeah. on a government policy that's now been changed. You can up, you can understand why they're frustrated. Well, look, as I say, it, as it, this moves us into the into the pack. So they will of course make these investments, but they'll be making investments across the European market, across the G7. So they're, they're just and mining them. And, no, I, I wouldn't. Of course, I don't use that expression. But but what I'm saying is that the UK's position. We have been so far out ahead of other nations, and we are still out ahead of other nations, both in terms of ambition and achievement. But all this means is that we're then, so far as that um, the car point, we're closer to the pack. That's all it means. Now, in the speech, uh, Rishi Sunak also said that he'd blocked plans to tax meat, introduce compulsory car sharing, and make people sort their rubbish into seven bins. Can you remind me when these things were actually going to happen? Because, I mean, maybe I've got amnesia. I can't remember any of these. All right, well, listen, I, I'm the Justice Secretary, as you know, but I think... I, I don't know precisely who, who has said these things. Seven what I do bins? Know, I mean, what would you have been putting seven bins? What, what I can say... what a I meat tax. What I, what I can say is that I think the Climate Change Committee has been making certain have suggestions you also, about how we... Have you also blocked plans can... to, like, ban people from eating ice cream for dessert as well? It's like, what...? Uh, uh, look, I don't know specifically who said it, but what I can say is that Climate Change Committee have made certain suggestions, and I think, from memory, they've said certain things about how you should approach uh, dairy I mean, and these meat. Very, come so, on, these are the, very the, different. I think, if some, I think, like, somebody has made suggestions, Richie Sunak said he blocked these measures coming but, in. So the I think the, no, but I think what he's it's saying... So no, 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 it's, it's, no, it's not. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not can I, the really important point that he's saying is that we will do this in a way which takes the people with us, OK? And all I am saying is that I think there is a danger that people don't realise how far we've come as a nation, how far we are ahead of other nations. In, let me just give you one thing today. If you, any of your viewers now were to go on their phones and they were to look at the national grid for the UK and they would say, on this day, it could be any, this day, what percentage of our electricity was generated from fossil fuels? Do you know what it is? It was around 12%. So meanwhile, of about three and a half gigawatts that was produced from coal and gas, about 17 gigawatts was produced from offshore wind. We have more offshore wind installed in this country than any country on the planet apart from China, more than Germany, more than France, Italy, the United States. We have done incredible things over the last 10 years or so, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. We are way ahead of other nations. I want to talk about Russell Brand. Now, it's important to say, first of all, I've got no more knowledge than you do about the allegations surrounding him. He denies them. He says it's all part of a conspiracy by the mainstream media, which I guess I'm a part of. He was a part of it too. And now the mainstream media is asking questions of itself. And let's not forget, he was also embraced by parts of the political establishment as well. But there's one thing that I do know. I totally understand why you might not want to go to the police if you were raped or sexually assaulted by a famous or powerful man. If you decide to go to the police, then what happens? An intimate physical examination after you've just been assaulted? And then the questions start. What's your proof? Did you give him the come on? Did you have sex with him before? Are you a believable witness? Will you cry on the stand? But not too much, not like Amber Heard. And if you fail to make the grade, then your case gets dropped. And even if you do make it to court, what happens then? Firstly, a long delay, we know that. And even if you're successful, you'll always be known as the woman who accused that powerful person of rape. Your name might get out on social media. How are his fans or allies going to react? What will it do to your career? So I don't know what happened with Russell Brand. I don't know if he's telling the truth. 
But I do understand why women might not report rape to the police. That I do get. Well, those were my thoughts when the allegations first broke. And later in the week, I spoke to Georgina Bailey, the granddaughter of the Fawlty Towers actor Andrew Sachs. And of course, she was at the centre of the so-called Saxgate scandal, which led to Russell Brown getting sacked from the BBC. There is some strong language coming up in this interview, but we've kept it in because I feel it's important for Georgina to tell her story in her own words. Because you were thrown into the spotlight, right? Mm -hmm. um, when Russell Brand and Jonathan Ross left a series of offensive voicemails on your grandfather's phone, do you sort of remember what, what they said? Do you know what? It, it was such a long time ago, but I... It was just a really weird, like, situation where I didn't really feel connected to myself. I didn't know what was going on, and I just put myself wherever they told me to go. And, um, yeah, I was in fight or flight. I was very, very... Um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't very well in the head. <laughs> how, how did you first find out what happened? So I was at work and um, Russell called me. I missed it because I was working. And he said, you better break into your grandparents' house because uh, me and my naughty friend, Jonathan, and then I heard him cackling in the background. Um, have left a message on on his answering machine. And I was like, oh, God, like, here we go. Because I already had a strained relationship with them because at that time I was going through a lot of... I had undiagnosed mental health issues and I also, you know, was on, on the way to becoming a full-blown addict. And, um, yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> yeah. And he was, I guess, treating it as a joke. Yeah, well, it was. You know, it was, and I was a joke. I was a joke to everybody, and I dared to open my mouth. But she doesn't matter, because look at her. You know, it, it, I was the unknown being kissed and told on, and my biggest mistake was talking about it. I shouldn't have said a word, because at that time, they would twist everything in the men's favour. So Russell went off and, and did a tour all about it, and there I was, couldn't get a job. Couldn't get a day clean and sober. Um, it was really rubbish. What really struck me about the time, and I really remember the story. You know, we're the sort of same age. I, I remember what, what a big story we are it was. The same at the time. age, exactly the same <laughs> age. Um, but it was all told through the lens of the men involved. Yeah. It was told about the impact on your grandfather, and not really about the impact on you. Mm -hmm. Did you sort of feel that? Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I do. I have managed to, like, say my piece a few times. And I think as the years have gone by, my words are twisted less and less. Mm -hmm. At the time, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to say anything because I knew that they would sew together what they wanted so that they got the narrative. Um, and so I just feel like it was just total slut-shaming, you know, the big Scarlet S on me and oh well but it doesn't matter boys will be boys because she's a slut so it's fine it doesn't matter who her grandfather is and really I could be the biggest slut in the entire world and it would still be wrong what they're doing what they they bullied my grandfather who was a sweet old man didn't deserve it didn't ask for it I I wish that I had never told Russell who he was because I didn't need to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like Russell Brand almost made money out of what happened. He did. He did. But it impacted your career in a negative way. Well, I mean, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, you know, so I had to spend 10 years trying to figure that out. Um, and luckily, Adam Ant gave me a job in his band, so that was really nice. It put some distance between being the sax gate girl and the present in that time. So that was during my mid 20s. And then that sort of dried up, and then I went to drama school, and that's where, like, the, the drink and the drugs really became a problem. YouTube have today stopped Russell Brown being able to make money uh, out of his videos on YouTube. Really? Do you think that's a good thing? Or no. do you think it's cancel culture? No, it's cancel culture, because, look, Russell made a mistake when he was younger, right? And when he made his amends to me, he looked me in the eye, apologised, and said, you know, he wasn't working a programme 
And as an addict in recovery, I understand where he's coming from. So what happens with addiction is you can cross addict onto other things. So um, if you if you put down, let's say, I don't know, heroin, you might pick up a behavior addiction if you're not working a program like bulimia or sex addiction. And so obviously Russell was newly clean and sober, fairly newly, newly clean and sober. And I think it's very common for, for people to cross addict into sex addiction. And when he made his amends to me, I felt like he took full ownership of that. Because he did say sorry to you, right? He, he, he looked me in the eyes and apologized. And he also sent me to rehab, you know, so I, that's all I can ask. Have you forgiven him? I have, yeah, that, that, that's all I can ask of somebody in recovery that's working the same steps that I am. How about the BBC? Um, because it feels to me like, this is the other part of the story, right? He was almost encouraged by some of the media companies and some of the production companies around him. Do you forget the BBC? I don't really care about them. They don't take up any airspace in my mind. <laughs> Are you glad that there's investigations going on into some of his behavior? Anybody that's been a victim of sexual abuse needs justice. I don't know what happened there. I don't know because I wasn't there. He never did anything like that with me. Everything was more than consensual, I promise. But um, I, I, I've seen some of the evidence and I do find it quite compelling, to say the least. <laughs> do you believe them? I know it's hard to... I can't really say, like, like I, I don't have all the evidence. But you find it compelling. I do. Well. Yeah. I find it compelling and we'll leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that does make sense. Um, We've been talking a bit about what happened to you and the attitudes at the time. Do you think things have got better? Yeah. If it were to happen now, it, his career would be over. And so would Jonathan Ross's, who is the one that I actually have more of a problem with. Really? Yeah. And why is that? Because he never saw fit to talk to me. So he hasn't apologised? He never said a word. And I think he will never say a word because I, I'm a slut. I'm not important, right? That's interesting that he hasn't apologised to you. No. I'd assumed, to be completely honest, that he had. No, he apologised to my granddad because he's respectable, but I'm, I'm just some girl uh, who, who did a kiss and tell in his eyes. So he apologised to your granddad, but not to you? Yeah, yeah. Would you like him to apologise now? I don't, no, I don't care about him enough. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I would, just some, some sort of acknowledgement would be nice, you know, because I feel like I don't matter, you know? And, um, and that is part of the shame that comes with addiction. You know, I've had to do a lot of very hard work to get to where I am mentally. And um, I think a lot of things have been brushed under the carpet and it's time to get them out. Well, you're doing that now. I am, I quite like it, even though this is a lovely carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, let's get my piece of paper. You'll understand why in a minute. Uh, we all claim to want our politicians to be what you might call normal people. But what happens when they try to be just that? Now, in his new book about the past 13 year of Conservative rule, the Telegraph political editor Ben Riley Smith has revealed that Rishi Sunak loves the song Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice and can even rap the lyrics. Uh, now, we're not going to ask Nick and Christine to do that. Well, if you if you want to, oh, you joke. No. <laughs> uh, it's no given way. us a chance to dig out the songs that previous prime ministers had claimed to love. See if you can guess who chose these songs. Thank you for the days, those endless days, those sacred days you gave me.
Some quite good choices there, I thought. Yeah. Any, anyone, you, anyone you know? <laughs> Do you know what I'm afraid to admit? It's Dancing Queen, you've got to go with <laughs> Theresa, Theresa May. Abs well, that's right. absolutely right. Dancing yeah. Queen, Theresa May. Great okay. song. Great song. I'll have a stab at Brown Eyed Girl for David Cameron. Actually, Boris Johnson. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Boris Johnson went for Brown Eyed Girl. I thought the Supremes might be John Major because he's about that age. Very good. It was, correct. Um, um, the boss, as in Bruce Springsteen, Tony Blair? Yes, very good. Oh, 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 oh. Which I think this isn't bad. Bob Dylan as Gordon Brown. It, Bob Dylan was David Cameron. No. Uh, oh, Tangled Up yeah, in Blue. Yeah, Tangled Up in Blue. Okay. Maybe it was a bit of a pun on the yeah. name. I'm not can sure I, if I believe that one. Can I suggest one for Liz Truss after our conversation? Shag, okay. Shaggy's It Wasn't Me. <laughs> <laughs> She needs to do it, it wasn't me. I love that. That's absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And the only oh, one sorry. we're left was with was uh, Gordon Brown, which was Kirsty McCall. Oh, of course it was. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Shaggy. Yeah, yeah that should be. One. You could do the lyrics. We'll try and work on that on next time I see you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we should. <laughs> ice, ice Baby, though, Rishi oh. Sunak. Yeah, this is apparently... I'm not sure the... that's the look that he's going for. Well, this is the one, isn't it? He listens to Heart Naughties. He loves Ice Ice Baby. And he reads Jilly Cooper and enjoys watching Bridgerton. Now I'm sure all of the above is true. I have no. Yeah. Actually, Ben's book looks fantastic, doesn't it? It's coming out, I think, in a couple of yeah, weeks' does, time. Really so does. that looks great value. It does a kind of chime with the sort of head boy of Winchester and the sort of background that we know, does it? Oh, or perhaps maybe that's me. it does. Or maybe, maybe it, it does. does. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that think. world. <laughs> <laughs> favourite songs then, if you put on the spot. Oh. Favourite artists. Do you know this is my least favourite question? You can ask Sorry. me anything about politics, but it's my least favourite because it changes. Is it my least? Is it my favourite to play? Is it my favourite to listen to? My favourite for my sisters to play? But I think it comes down to two. One is "Don't Stop" by Fleetwood Mac, yeah. and the other is Adele's "When We Were Young." Very nice. I've Ding got dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> How about that one? <laughs> and I won't say any more. <laughs> I can't even. I can't even. <laughs> A reminder, the Politics Hub keeps going all day, every day on the Sky News website and app. And if you scan the QR code, you can catch up with all the latest from Westminster and beyond. We're back on your screens every Monday to Thursday night at 7pm. See you then.